The long-awaited Barbie movie is finally here, and apparently it is way more insufferable than people expected. But we've got an analysis for you from producer Brie and from me on that. Also, we'll be talking about the backlash to country music star Jason Aldean's song, Try That in a Small Town. Why is he being called pro-lynching? Also, the myth that you see circulating that Governor DeSantis and the Florida curriculum is somehow pro-slavery. We've got to debunk all that. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Alley for a discount at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Alley. GoodRanchers.com. Code Alley. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Monday. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day so far. Had a wonderful weekend. Uh, We've got a lot of pop culture stuff to talk about and also debunking some myths about the state of Florida being pro-slavery. What, what, what? I'm so glad to be back in the studio. So hopefully it sounds and looks as normal to you guys. Um, It's Monday. So do the next right thing in faith with excellence and for the glory of God that is always enough, always sufficient. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're feeling, that is always the commitment we can make. Just do the next right thing. Uh, All right, just a reminder before we get into all of this, we've just got a few weeks until my maternity leave. Guys, can you believe it? I'm going into my ninth month of pregnancy. I am 35 weeks. And so I'm going to uh, start maternity leave before my due date, a little before my due date, because you know, you just never know. And just want a little time to prep and nest and all that good stuff. But because we at Relatable love you all so much, because we care so much about this show, we didn't want to leave you hanging. So we have pre-recorded since the beginning of the year to today. So many amazing episodes for you guys. So you will have something to listen to Monday through Thursday. Most of these are going to be interviews with really fascinating guests. And oh my gosh, I've been wanting to put so many of these episodes out because I cannot wait for you to hear them. Just like some of the most fascinating conversations I've had. And then we've got some Q&A episodes too. A lot of the, just FYI, a lot of the Uh, interviews because they're so long. You guys know I could talk to most of my guests for like hours and hours because I just find them so brilliant and interesting. Uh, They're going to be split into two parts. Man, we're talking about all kinds of theological issues, all kinds of um, like health medical things that I didn't know about before talking to a lot of people, a lot of controversial topics and takes that you guys are going to enjoy listening to during the 12-ish weeks that I will be gone from August to whenever that ends. And I will be popping up on social media and things like that. I'll let you know when the baby arrives, but I just wanted to give you an FYI. So we won't be able to talk about the news, obviously, the things that are going viral. I'm not going to be in the news cycle in those um, episodes, but they're still going to be extremely educating and edifying for all of you. And so it's really helpful for the show if even during that time when we're not talking about the news and what's going on in the moment, if you could not just listen to and faithfully watch those episodes, but also if you could share them, if you could talk about them on social media, it helps um, because we love to be talking about, you know, what other people are talking about, what you guys are asking me about. Can you comment on this news story, this social media post, this issue that's happening right now? Obviously, because I want to give myself, my family and our team a break, we won't be able to do that. But if you could still just stay as dedicated as you are and then share it with other people too, that really helps and continue to leave your five-star reviews if you love the show. All of that helps so much. It just sets us up well for when we come back for maternity leave. So appreciate you guys so much. All right, let's get into the three things that we're going to talk about today. Let's start with this Jason Aldean story and then we'll get into the Barbie stuff. Um, Okay, I know that you guys probably saw this last week, but I just had to talk about it because it is so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous that this is even a thing. And if you don't know, you will. So Jason Aldean is a country singer and he performed a song or he released a song in May called Try That in a Small 
town May 19th of this year and then the music video premiered July 14th 2023 and it was after the music video premiered I guess a few days after that that the song started stoking a lot of controversy because of its content because of its, its lyrics now Right now, it's got over 15 million views on YouTube, the music video. It is also the number two most played song in the U.S. on Apple Music. It's climbing the charts largely because of this controversy. People are calling the song racist, white supremacist, um, pro-lynching. So let me read you some of the lyrics that people are calling so racist and white supremacist. Sucker punch somebody on a sidewalk, carjack an old lady at a red light, pull a gun on the owner of a liquor store. You think it's cool? Well, act a fool if you like. Cuss out a cop, spit in his face, stomp on the flag and light it up. Yeah, you think you're tough. And then here's the chorus. Well, try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. Around here, we take care of our own. You cross that line. It won't take long for you to find out. I recommend you don't. Try that in a small town. Got a gun my granddad gave me. They say one day they're going to round up. Well, that bleep might fly in the city. Good luck. Try that in a small town. So basically that on repeat. And then you've got the music video that in the background, you do see some uh, different riots that are reminiscent of 2020, 2021, and the different uh, reports of violence that we've seen. It seems increased dramatically over the past few years. And here is a clip of that music video that people are so upset about. Suck punch somebody on the sidewalk. Carjacking old lady at a red light. Pull a gun on the owner of a liquor store. You think it's cool, act the fool if you like. Cuss out a cop, spit in his face. Stomp on the flag and light it up. Yeah, you think it's tough. Well, try that. Okay, so there it is. In the background, you've got a lot of the things that were happening in 2020, the disrespect towards police officers, the burning of the flags, the rights, the protests, the um, theft happening at convenience stores. People didn't like that. People also noted that he was standing in front of a building, apparently, that has some racist historic significance. And so people are, as I said, calling him a racist. So here's some of the backlash that he's received. Shannon Watts of Moms Demand Action. She blocked me on Twitter a long time ago. I think like 2017. Um, she took issue with the lyrics since Aldine survived the Las Vegas mass shooting. Uh, she posted the lyrics and said, uh, Jason Aldean, who was on stage during the mass shooting at a Las Vegas concert in 2017 that killed 60 people and wounded over 400 more, has recorded a song called Try That in a Small Town about he and his friends will shoot you if you try to take their guns. That's not what he said. Police reform activist Brittany Packnett Cunningham accused the singer of not telling the truth about shootings in small towns, saying that most mass shootings occur in small towns. She said Uvalde, VA Tech, Newtown, uh, Parkland, all of these were small towns. Most mass shootings occur in small towns. Your listeners are dying. Now, this is not true. She may have been referencing um, an AP report in 2018 that said that nine out of 10 of the deadliest school shootings in the U.S. took place in a town with fewer than 75,000 residents. Um, and the vast majority of them were in cities with fewer than 50,000 people. But as far as mass shootings go, it is not true that most of those are happening in small towns. According to CP, uh, CBS for mass shootings in which four or more people are hit by gunfire. That's how it's defined. In all of the United States, Sh Chicago has the greatest number of any city, large or small. There have been 24 mass shootings in Chicago this year alone. This was in 2022, uh, which have left 12 people dead and 101 people injured. We know this. Okay, this is gaslighting. We know where the violence is happening. And by the way, if you adjusted the definition of mass shooting, to be three or more, the number of mass shootings that would be recorded occurring in those 
uh, large cities would spike drastically. Philadelphia comes in second with 14 mass shootings last year, followed by New York City with 10, Baltimore with 8, and Houston with 7. Of course, we know that just run-of-the-mill gang violence, gun violence happens frequently in those cities. I mean, who are we kidding? We know where the majority of gun violence is happening. Now, I'm not saying that violence never happens in small towns. I'm not saying that it's not a problem. But we understand what inner cities look like. Like, we understand how dangerous it can be to take public transportation in those areas. We understand that the downtowns of most of those major cities have been absolutely decimated by the progressive social justice, pro-drug, pro-crime policies that have been implemented uh, by Democrats. We understand that. And so... They can try to gaslight us. They can try to manipulate us. They can try to say that Jason Aldean doesn't know what he's talking about. We all know the truth. So, again, he is also being accused of being pro-lynching. Mississippi Free Press News Editor Ashton Pittman criticized Aldean for choosing a controversial location, the Maury County Courthouse in Columbia, Tennessee. Um, Apparently, there was a a white lynching mob that killed a person there in 19... 27 as if I'm sure that Jason Aldean I'm sure that he knew that piece of history and he decided oh I am I'm going to commemorate this terrible awful thing that happened in 1927 here okay the company that produced the music video tackle box films responded with the statement saying that Aldean did not choose the filming location of course of course not the production company says any alternative narrative suggesting the music video's location decision uh, is false alternative narrative to what they said that this is a popular place to film different kinds of videos. Uh, the women at the View weighed in with Sunny Hostin claiming Aldine's hometown is one of the most racist places ever, and she doesn't believe he didn't understand the symbolism. Here she is. Do you, you do are. agree that he should be allowed to say I, whatever he because wants? Because as a lawyer, when I put my legal hat on, yeah, okay. I don't believe in censorship. Right. However, this man is from Macon, Georgia. My father's from Augusta, Georgia, and Macon, Georgia. I both? spent many summers there. Yeah, both. I spent many summers mm-hmm. there. It is one of the most racist places in this country. Mm-hmm. So don't tell me that? that he knew nothing I'm about not, what that imagery meant say he didn't and what anything. he... So I don't give him the benefit. But I'm saying, of, I don't along with him, more doubt. people should the also other, be the other held thing accountable. Is, and unfortunately, this became the number one song on U.S. iTunes. U.S. iTunes. Did you hear that, Macon, Georgia? I've been to good old Macon, Georgia. How do you quantify that? Like, how how do you decide that a city is one of the most racist places? How do you measure that? Is it just because it's in the South and there's a lot of white people and at one point there were slaves? Like, how do you decide what city in the United States is the most racist? Augusta, Georgia, also been there. Beautiful. Actually, look, right here, right here. This does not stand for the racist capital of the world, by the way. That just happens to be where they hold the masters every year. But Sonny says that they're the most racist places in the world. And so because of where he's from, because Jason Aldean is from Macon, Georgia. He understands the symbolism of a courthouse in Columbia, Tennessee, because that makes a whole lot of sense. This is her apparently with her like lawyer hat on, she says. Okay, so the country music industry is also is also criticizing him. They are also throwing him under the bus because of this apparently racist song. And I just want to pause for a second and and say that the lyrics never mention race. They never mention black people. They never mention melanin count. They never mention the color of someone's skin. In fact, in the music video, if you saw, like there are white women, there are people of all different ethnicities, of all different melanin counts represented in the music video. The common theme was violence. The common theme was disrespect and destruction. That's what he is opposing. And Uh, Yet they're making it about black people. Now, maybe the people who see this automatically as some kind of racist dog whistle should ask themselves why they automatically think of black people when they hear the term carjacking. Why do you automatically think of black people when you hear lyrics about theft? 
or burning the flag or causing destruction and disarray and committing those crimes. Why is that where your mind goes? Maybe you should ask yourself that. Race is never explicitly mentioned in any of these lyrics, and yet all of your minds immediately go to black people committing those crimes. And so you accuse Jason Aldean of being a white supremacist when he never talks about black people. Maybe you should ask yourself why that is where your mind so quickly automatically goes. So as I said, CMT, country music television, Uh, The country music industry, they are also saying, oh my goodness, this is just an awful song. I can't believe that Jason Aldean is doing this. So we'll get into that in just one second. Let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is a company that loves America, and they also love high-quality meat. They uh, take pride in the quality and in the process through which their meat goes. They really care about the farms. They really care about their ranches. They really care about the people that they work with. That's why they have worked so hard to make such a high quality company that runs its business with integrity and makes sure all of its customers are happy. I love working with them for all of those reasons. They're pro-God, they're pro-America, and their meat and their service makes our life so much easier. Every month, we get a box of chicken, better than organic chicken, craft beef with um, with uh, ground beef and different cuts of steak. We even get seafood sometimes, and it's just a sense of security and comfort to know that I've got high quality American meat in my freezer that I can use every night of the week. So I really encourage you, if you haven't already, just try your box of Good Ranchers meat. You will not regret it. You won't go back either because once you subscribe and you don't have to think about purchasing meat when you go into the grocery store, you'll see what I mean by when I say that this just makes your life so much better. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie for $30 off your box at GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie for that discount. GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Okay, so CMT, Country Music Television, pulls the controversial Jason Aldean music video, so they won't play it. They won't play it anymore. CMT confirmed that after initially airing Jason Aldean's music video, the network pulled the video from air. The video debuted on July 14th. It was pulled by July 17th. Cheryl Crow, Grammy Award-winning artist, uh, she added her disgust to the commentary, to the dialogue. She said, I'm from a small town. Even people in small towns are sick of violence. There's nothing small town or American about promoting violence. I would say that's exactly what he's saying. He's sick of the violence. Like, he's sick of the crime. He's sick of criminals getting away with uh, violating the rights and the safety of vulnerable people. She says, you should know that better than anyone having survived a mass shooting. This is not American or small town like. It's just lame. Jason Isbell, he is a Grammy Award winning singer songwriter. He said, dare Aldean to write his next single himself. That's what we try in my small town. And then you've got Jake Owen, who is uh, who is also a country star. And he said, Jason to this uh, Jason Isbell person. You're always the first to get behind your keyboard and spout off with this stupid bleep. In my small town, you just walk up to the guy and be a man to his face if you want the smoke. Not tweet at him. Tough guy. And so there was all kinds of back and forth. Some A lot of people defending Jason Aldean. A lot of people criticizing Aldean online over the weekend. And this probably wouldn't have been a controversy in country music a few years ago, even five to ten years ago. But because country music has gotten more liberal because it's moved to the left just like every other institution every other industry now saying something like yeah we're going to take care of ourselves our families our friends our community in a small town we're going to be anti-crime we're going to be anti-exploiting the weak and the vulnerable we're going to be anti-destruction and chaos and anarchy in my small town now that's apparently very not just controversial but also outright racist. Now, the Aldeans have been the center of controversy in the past because they're very outspoken about not liking Joe Biden. And Brittany Aldean, uh, Jason Aldean's wife, is 
uh, very popular on social media, and she has merchandise that is anti-Biden. They're very pro-America. They're very uh, conservative, anti-Democrat, and all of that. And so Maren Morris is another country singer, and she has called Brittany Aldean insurrection, uh, insurrection Barbie um, being accuse them of being transphobic, whatever the heck that means. Maren Morris was also one of the artists, along with Sheryl Crow, along with Jason Isbell, and some other country singers um, to announce their participation earlier this year in something called Love Rising, which was a benefit concert taking place in Nashville to support Tennessee-based LGBTQ organizations. The event was held in response to two laws passed in Tennessee, one that bans so-called gender affirming care on minors and the other prohibiting drag queens from performing in front of minors. And so all of these country stars decided that they were going to perform a concert to support uh, kids getting uh, chemically castrated and girls getting double mastectomies because they are supposedly confused about their gender. They performed a concert to support the idea of drag queens, a.k.a. grown men in um, scandalous outfits, reading books in front of kids, dancing, twerking in front of kids. That's what they wanted to support. That's what they wanted to make sure that you knew uh, they were on the side of. So that's where a lot of country music is going. You'll also remember that Kelsey Ballerini, uh, that she performed a song we reacted to at the CMAs earlier this year. Her song was or is, If You Go Down, I'm Going Down Too. She basically is describing um, the loyalty of her friendship that if she decides Uh, If her friend decides to kill her husband, (laughs) that Kelsey Ballerini is going to be on her side and keep her secret. So these lyrics apparently are totally fine, can even be performed at the CMAs. She said, I keep all your secrets by the dozen. You know where my skeletons sleep. Hypothetically, if you ever kill your husband, hand on the Bible, I'd be lying through my teeth. So we can talk about that apparently. That's okay. Talking about killing your husband and then lying about it, that's fine. But talking about defending yourself, self-defense in a small town, that's just too far for the country music world. She also uh, sang the song on stage at the CMT Awards, this uh, CMA, earlier this year, uh, surrounded by a bunch of drag queens from RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, Again, it seemed like she was taking a stand on the Senate Bill 3 in Tennessee, which prohibits drag performers in front of minors. So they're saying these things are wonderful. Like we should allow men in prosthetic breasts to twerk and to shimmy and to dance in front of children. That's where the country music industry is now. And I guess the Aldeans are outside of that because they're sane people. And so because they're outside of that, they have to be ostracized or they have to be criticized. They have to be demonized by all of these woke, super progressive country music stars. So times they are a change in. They are a change in. Like this is where the country music world is now. Jason Aldean has a response to all of this craziness and it's a long response I won't read the whole thing he does talk about how he never brought up race in the song try that in a small town for me refers to the feeling of a community that I had growing up where we took care of our neighbors regardless of differences of background or belief because they were our neighbors and that was above any differences my political views have never been something I've hidden from and I know that a lot of us in this country don't agree on how we get back to a sense of normalcy where we go at least a day without a headline that keeps us up at night but the desire for it to that's what this song is about so whether you like the song or not whether you're a fan of country music whether you think the song is cool or corny it really doesn't matter. He does not deserve the backlash that he has received. He definitely doesn't deserve for the music video to be taken off country music television. Uh, He's also talked about uh, cancel culture and how, you know, it's ruining our country, how it's not allowing us to uh, get to a place of unity anymore. And I've also seen a lot of people point out just how hypocritical the criticism is of Jason Aldean here. Um, there is, uh, 
there's a lot of comparisons. There are a lot of comparisons going around between Jason Aldean's lyrics and the rap lyrics that are literally destructive to Black Americans. So compare what we know from Jason Aldean's song to songs like this and tell me what you think is more detrimental, is more deleterious to Black people in America. Uh, Here's a song. Rapper Jeffrey Young Thug Williams. I don't know anything about this person. It might surprise you to learn that I don't regularly listen to rap. But it was in the top 100 on the U.S. singles chart. So this is not just random. He says this. I got a bag and ain't enough. My left wrist bling. Yes, it is tough. I killed his man in front of his mama. Like, it, I don't know. Like, oh, F, little bruh, sister and his cousin. Now I kick my S. That ain't no punt. Like, F my wrist. It ain't enough. Now F my B. Till it ain't nothing. I shoot out blank. Still ain't cuffing up. And obviously, if you've listened to any rap music at all, like you will know that murder is a theme. Violence is a theme. Theft is a theme. Uh, Superficiality, materialism, money for the sake of money. All of these are very prominent themes in rap and hip hop music. You've got Tyler, the creator song. Tron Cat. Now, he's a Grammy-winning artist. Most of you probably know who he is. While you inward stacking bread, I can stack a couple dead bodies, making red look less of a color, more of a hobby. Rape a pregnant bee and tell my friends I had a threesome. You got a effing death wish? I'm a genie. It'll get done. So this is a Grammy Award-winning artist. And then we've got an artist named Suki Hana. Suki Hana, she apparently is popular and she's got a music video out that I can't, it's been circulating on Twitter. I cannot show you. I can't show you the video. I will show you this full screen though in this awful music video that will just make you want to burn your eyes. She is holding a baby for some reason. She's holding a baby in a baby carrier and around her are a bunch of nearly naked people twerking they're twerking on roofs they're twerking on each other they're twerking in people's face it's very very odd and here are some of the lyrics I'm a west side hoe everybody know that I f with the boosters and the bees that that sell they stamps and bees that sell they p word with they legs on a ramp I'm a f your baby daddy and I'm a f him again I'm a Wow, I can't even like abbreviate this. S is D with no ha- without no hands. Without no hands. So is that with hands? <laughs> uh, spend his bread, then F yo man. You heard what I said. What the F I said. I'll beat yo A, then F yo man. So here's some, those are some popular songs uh, that are uh, circulating right now. And I think it's pretty explicit that they are promoting violence in all kinds of depravity and degeneracy. You cannot tell me that the same people who are promoting songs like this are really truly offended and harmed by Jason Aldean's song about not tolerating carjacking. I mean, let's let's be serious here. If like because I know people get so offended when you say, oh, well, rap music and a lot of hip hop music like it's really degenerate. It probably doesn't have a great effect on the people who are listening to it. This is probably not the best influence on young people, no matter what your race and ethnicity. People get so offended by that. Like, no, this is just art. This has no effect on people. This doesn't impact people at all. People can listen to this and it's just great and it's edifying. It's just the beat. It's just artistry. It's just creativity. Like, we should just accept this and celebrate this. And if you criticize this at all, you're racist. Those people who have just, I guess, such like an objective sense of uh, what makes for high quality art, all of a sudden 
believe that song lyrics from Jason Aldean are going to become humans and start a lynching mob in front of a courthouse in Columbia, Tennessee. So which one is it? Like, do songs really matter? Are they a real reflection of culture and people's morality? Are they really impactful and really dangerous? Can they really make a tangible difference? Or do they not? Because if so, I think we can find far more examples of the explicit promotion of violence and degeneracy in a lot of the rap songs that are promoted than we can in any of Jason Aldean's songs. So again, let's just be, let's be real about that. It's just because you're not allowed to promote self-defense. That's the thing. You're not allowed to promote self-defense. You're not allowed to promote whatever small town values are. That is supposed to make us very angry. But songs like the ones that I just read the lyrics from, those are not supposed to make us angry. We're supposed to ignore that and pretend like those are indicative of healthy culture and healthy morality. I don't know. I'm just not there. I'm not there. All right. Speaking of culture. Let's talk a little bit about Barbie. But first, let me tell you about our second sponsor for the day, and that is Patriot. That's Patriot Mobile. Patriot Mobile is America's only Christian conservative wireless provider offering dependable nationwide coverage on all three major networks. So you get the best possible service in your area, minus the leftist propaganda, the leftist agenda, because a lot of these major uh, companies, these major mobile companies are actually using your money to support causes that you don't believe in. That is not the case with Patriot Mobile. When you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending a message that you support free speech, religious freedom, the sanctity of life, Second Amendment, our military veterans, and first responder heroes. They've got an amazing customer service team. They're all USA-based. They make switching really easy. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Allie or call 878-PATRIOT for free activation with my offer code Allie. patriotmobile.com slash Allie, patriotmobile.com slash Allie. All right, let's talk about Barbie. Now, I did not see Barbie myself, and I will not see Barbie. So I'm just letting you know that. But uh, producer Brie has been wanting to see, or ha- yeah, she's been talking about Barbie for a long time. She's been really excited about seeing Barbie. She's like, oh my gosh, this is one of my favorite directors. And I was like, no one says that unless you went to USC, which she did. <laughs> That's a very USC graduate thing to say that I went to the University of Southern California and I lived in Southern California and out there we have favorite directors. So Greta Gerwig, right, yeah. is one of your favorite directors. What else has she directed? She has directed, well, the most notable thing she directed was the a new adaptation of Little Women, okay. which I thought was brilliant. I like Little Women. I haven't seen it. It's so, so good. Okay. I think she added really beautiful touches to it. She's and great. So you were hopeful for Barbie that it would be good? I was so hopeful. Were yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, that it would be good? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I trusted her. You is did? the thing. I did. Okay. Um, yeah, I trusted her fully. I got inklings as I went in, though. Yeah. Well, other people saw it before you did, yeah. and I'm sure you saw some of the commentary online that mm-hmm. it was, you know, a very explicit progressive agenda, which we'll get into. But the marketing for it, leading up to it, you've got Margot Robbie and you've got Ryan Gosling. I really like both of them a lot. And they did a really good job of making you think this is just going to be a fun movie that is over the top and really colorful and but I knew I'm like we don't produce as a country those kinds of movies anymore we don't produce non-political content everything has to have an agenda everything has to have an underlying progressive message there's no way they're going to put out a movie that's just a bunch of pretty people having a good time with a normal rising action climax falling action conclusion type arc there's just no way that they're going to do it so I didn't know anything about Greta so I didn't know you know what it was going to be but I just had that expectation because so few so few movies or shows nowadays come out just because of entertainment value so let me play um uh, let me play a little bit of the trailer first because I just want to show people if you didn't see the many many ads for this that have been uh, coming out leading up to the release of the movie. I want you to see 
that any kind of political messaging was very carefully excluded from any of these teasers or trailers or clips that we saw. So here's a little bit of that. Barbie in the real world. That's impossible. If this got out, this could mean extremely weird things for our world. This would be catastrophic! We haven't played with Barbie since we were like five years old. Oh. No one rests until this doll is back in a box. Even if nobody else sings along. Humans only have one ending. Get that Barbie! Ideas live forever. No, I won't let you do just one appendectomy. But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Can I talk to a doctor? You are talking to a doctor. Can I need a clicky pen? No. A sharp thing? No. There he is. Doctor! Somebody get security. Is Bobby booked if you're still in doubt? <laughs> okay, so you did kind of see an indication of what it was going to be right in that last conversation with Ryan Gosling. But, okay, I if I just saw that trailer, I would want to see that movie. Not knowing everything that I know now about our entertainment industry, 2010 me would have loved that movie because the 2010 version of that movie would have been just funny and sweet and maybe pushing the boundaries a little bit when it comes to sexual promiscuity and whatever and suggestive language and things like that. But back in 2010, like honestly, 2006 to 2012 had some really, no, 2004, because it got to go back and get the notebook in there. Uh, 2004 to like 2012 had some really great entertaining movies. This would have been a really great movie then. But Brie, tell us like what really happened? What was the plot? And then what were the obvious themes that were being portrayed? Yeah. Um, so I will preface this. I know I've seen some people who really hated the movie saying how outrageous it was that this was for kids. It's not for kids. It's, I didn't think it was for kids either. Yeah. I was very confused when people said that. I was yeah, like, it's not. It's rated PG-13. People may argue that people are going to take their kids anyway. They probably will. But it's not rated for kids. Yeah. So keep that in mind. But um, so st- Margot Robbie plays stereotypical Barbie. Each Barbie in Barbie land has their own like you know, Dr. Barbie, Lawyer Barbie, etc. Um, and they all live in Barbie land. And it's a matriarchal society where women are in charge of everything. And the Kens are just kind of there. And um, each Barbie has a Ken. And they don't do anything really except for just kind of go to the beach. Um, and then one day, Barbie suddenly is like stricken with these uh, worries about mortality. And she doesn't know where they're coming from. And she she is told by um kate mckinnon's character that she has to go into the real world there's a rift and she has to go into kate the mckinnon real world. is the weird barbie yeah, girl, she right? plays a weird barbie who's been played with too much or something yeah which is a good gag yeah um and she has to go into the real world and find the little girl who's playing with her because her like feelings her sad feelings are seeping into barbie land hmm. they don't explain why no other barbie has ever dealt with this because surely there are other sad kids right yeah but um so she goes into the real world with ken ken follows her and um their arrival in the real world alarms the mattel ceo um he's he's alarmed by this who's will ferrell and he orders their capture. Barbie, tra- Barbie tracks down uh, her owner, which is a tween girl named Sasha, who criticizes her for encouraging unrealistic beauty standards. And then she finds out it's not Sasha that's her owner. It's Sasha's mom who picked up the Barbie one day and like t- to try to find a sense of like joy as a kid again. She started like making these drawings of like cellulite barbie and depression barbie and things like that the mom did (laughs) yeah okay um and that's why this margot robbie barbie is like feeling those things because the mom was playing with her um they have to rescue the they have to rescue barbie from mattel who's trying to put her in a box and send her back to barbie land which is what she wants so i was confused why she didn't want that also but so she goes into the world to try to figure out why she's sad. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So she goes, she finds out why Mattel wants to put her in a box and yeah. send her back to Barbie land. Yeah. She says no. 
I instead I'm gonna go back to Barbie Land with these two with the mom and the daughter that I found. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Um, so they go back to Barbie Land. Meanwhile, Ken has <laughs> learned about the patriarchy. Okay. He has gone Is off. Is that on his just own. like a random insertion, or do you see that throughout? It's a that- whole. It's the plot, which you'll see in a second. Okay. Um, he, meanwhile, while Barbie's doing this, is walking around and he's realizing, wow, people respect me here. People think I'm like in charge of things here. He's walking around. Okay, in the real world. Yeah, they're both in the real world. Okay, because in Barbie land, it's girls, girls rule. The, yeah, the Which reverse. Is, yeah. Okay, so, and he's kind of seen as a secondary character in Barbie land and not as important and so yeah. now he goes to the real world and he realizes that the patriarchy exists where kin rules. Yeah. Yeah. He's seeing businessmen and he's seeing doctors who are men. And he's like, wow, men can do that. So he takes the the patriarchy, which it's actually called that, back to Barbie land. So they don't even, why do you think, like, let me just pause. Like, why don't you think they even try to come up with like a clever <laughs> name for it? I think it's intentionally on the nose. Because a lot of the gags are. I just don't think it comes off like they intended for it to. Okay. So. Okay. Um, he goes back to Barbie land, turns it into the patriarchy. And when Barbie and, and the mom and daughter get back there, they've realized Ken has completely taken over. And now Barbie land is Kendom. And it's just run by men. Um, so they have to hatch a plan to take Barbie land back. And make it a matriarchy again. And they do this by completely manipulating the men in a very toxic way um, by each Barbie who has their own Ken. She goes off and flirts with a different Ken. And that gets the Kens all riled up and then they start fighting each other and get distracted. And that's how they win back Barbie land for the women. (laughs) Female empowerment. Wow. Um, and then at the end, Barbie meets with um, the creator, the ghost of the creator of Barbie, Ruth Handler, and asks her if she can become a human because she's still struggling with her the purpose of her life. And so she wants to go back into the patriarchy. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> this matriarchy stuff sucks. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so she does. As she becomes a human. It's not really explained how she's able to do that. And the last scene is Barbie going into a gynecologist appointment so that's her humanity that's what it boils down to but she doesn't have really friends or family or anything so does ken end up ken ends up what oh yeah so they when they take over again barbie land when the women take over um barbie apologizes to ken for kind of slighting him and you know but she says i'm still not interested in you you have to figure out who you are apart from me but like sorry for not paying attention to you that much i guess okay and he's like okay i'll find out who i am on my own that's the end of his story so he's still in barbie land he's still in barbie land under the matriarchy and she goes to the patriarchy <sighs> yep. where she has to get a gynecologist she has to go to the gynecologist she has to go to the gynecologist yeah. so um here are some of the ideological issues that i okay found. um in the first of all in the opening scene i haven't seen a lot of people point this out it's an homage to um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, but it's a, all these little girls playing with dolls, with mm-hmm. baby dolls. Mm-hmm. And the narrator's explaining, um, you know, little girls have always played with dolls, but they've always been bar- baby dolls until Barbie came around. And then there's the slow motion scene of all these little girls, like, smashing their baby dolls, like, on rocks and, like, destroying their baby dolls because now Barbie exists. Yeah, And I just thought it was kind of... Uh, it was a little, like a little on the nose. I don't think they were going for like abortion. This is about abortion, but it's but it's still a little destroying babies. And also, it's like not true because girls still play with baby. Dolls. I know, I know. Um, another thing that teen girl she has a speech when Barbie comes up to her, Sasha. Yes, Sasha. Um, she says, this is a quote from the movie. You represent everything wrong with our culture. You destroyed the planet with your glorification of rampant consumerism. You fascist. That's what <laughs> the teenage girl says to okay. Barbie. Well, I'll let you keep going. I'll ask this question because it, I'll ask this question later because it could apply to everything that you're saying. Okay. So go ahead. Um, 
the other thing I found funny was there. There's a man playing a woman playing a Barbie in this movie. Okay. Um. And so, there's also a trans. Yeah. Uh, like man identifying as a woman. Right. That's what I mean. The, yeah. Oh. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Um. So this is actor Hari Neff, I think is his name, but he's playing dr barbie which i thought was a funny touch yeah um and i just this whole movie is about patriarchy and feminism and and whatnot and i just thought it was really ironic that they hired a man and took a woman's job for this movie um patriarchy is a man stealing woman's job is it not but okay um and then there's a big issue of ken Barbie doesn't like Ken in this movie. She finds him annoying. At one point, she says, I don't want you here. Um, She doesn't really want anything to do with him. All he wants is to be treated decently and to be respected. And that's pretty clear in the film. Um, But I found it odd because he, Ken was created to be a companion for Barbie, like the toys. Um, And the whole movie, he's just, his moral is he has to learn to be apart from her. Um... So it's just, it's over, it, the overwhelming point is that women don't need men and women don't enjoy men and it's yeah. because of patriarchy and in the end men are still subservient to women and that's how it's intended to be. So so my question is, do you think it's a promotion of that idea or a critique of that idea? Because there, I've yeah. seen both takes because it's so on the nose, because it's so obvious, because everyone does or it seems like a lot of people do end up feeling bad for ken and because she goes back to the patriarchy the so-called patriarchy um by going to the real world some people are saying no this has a conservative message they're making fun like in that sasha speech they're making fun of young people for saying things like that when young people are super consumeristic yeah and then calling someone else calling barbie like the reason for consumerism the reason for fascism whatever um so what do you think? Do you think it's a promotion of those ideas or a critique of them? Uh, I think it's a promotion. I think that's a stretch. People saying that it's critiquing those progressive ideas. There are there there are a couple lines where I'm like, oh, they like almost got it. Sasha at one point is talking about Barbie and she's like, why are you like following that nut job? And then she stops herself and she goes, I mean, like um, intellectually challenged. <laughs> so it's like, that's supposed to be a joke. Yeah. But um, so it might be played with like a little bit of humor, but the overall message of the story is, is not that it's yeah. not, we're making fun of this. So but, why do you think they have her going back to the patriarchy then? And the, basically they, showing the matriarchy is not fun. And it's, like, the way that it was achieved is through manipulation. Yeah. I mean, they don't point those those things out, though. Yeah. She goes back to to the patriarchy, back to the real world, because she now has these feelings that she can't escape. So it's more of a, like, now I'm a human and I need to grapple with, like, the good and bad of being a human. But at the end, it says, you know, in, in Barbie land, the men have asked for some leadership roles now that, you know, at the end of the movie, they ask, you know, can maybe we have one man on the Supreme Court in Barbie land? And President Barbie says, no, but we can maybe put one of you like at a lower circuit court position. And the narrator says, maybe one day in Barbie land, um, the men will have just as much power as the women have in the real world. And so, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty it, obvious what they're trying. to. Yeah, do. it's pretty obvious. I know people are mad. I saw this tweet from someone who a, a progressive, lots of flags in their in their Twitter. And they said, um, two quibbled, raging heteronormativity and gender essentialism, but near perfection in movie form. So they really love they didn't love the gender. They didn't love that it was Barbie and Ken. Oh, yeah. Blue I saw some pink. people, and they're both white. They're both good looking. Yeah. They're both thin. So that part was wrong. It yeah. should have been more diverse. But the radical feminism was really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. So I got it. You don't think it's a critique. Some people saying it was a conservative message. I saw Libby Emmons. We've had her on our show several times. Why is the impulse of feminism to leave women alone, unmarried, childless, without close friends, without community? The reframing of what women want as identifiably male ambition is doing disservice to women. And it's fully exemplified in the Barbie movie. I mean, it does sound like that's what they showed. Like that basically the pinnacle of womanhood is to have power, to be working and to be in positions that have been traditionally held by men 
to be, I guess, without kids, smashing your baby dolls, whatever that was supposed to represent, alone, unmarried. Um, And we know from every data set that's available to us that that's not what makes people happy. Being alone, being childless in general is not what leads to supreme happiness. I'm not saying that no one in that position can be happy, but being without community, without purpose, without your, without uh, any sense of like uh, belonging is not what makes people happy. And men are still men and women are still women. And whether you like it or not, we still have different inclinations. We still have different strengths. Uh, We still have uh, different abilities that drive us to occupy different spheres. There is, do we have the clip of Snow White and the reaction to the Snow White girl saying, uh, Snow White is also another movie that's being reproduced to be more woke, to be more liberal, to be more diverse, and to change the narrative that women need men and uh, I guess also that the seven dwarves were all these like white men. Now they're this array of genders and colors and all of this stuff. But here was a a, a red carpet reaction from the girl playing Snow White about how this version of Snow White is an improvement on the archaic Snow White. You said you were bringing a modern edge to it on stage. What do you mean by that? I just mean that it's no longer 1937, and we absolutely wrote a Snow White that she's is not going to be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince, and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be, and the leader that her late father told her that she could be if she was fearless, fair, brave, and true. And so it's just a really incredible story for I think young people everywhere to see themselves in. Hmm, what's wrong with dreaming about true love? What's wrong with wanting to be loved? What's wrong with wanting to be married? What's wrong with wanting to find the one? And it depends on what you think about the one. Um, And if you think there's just one person or whether you think there's lots of people that you could be compatible with and end up with. But the fact of the matter is, the goal is to find the one person that you want to share life with forever that you're totally and completely committed to. I mean, that's a very high aspiration. I agree that that's not always the only aspiration or the highest aspiration. The highest aspiration is to glorify God. You can glorify God as a single person. You can glorify God as a wife and mom. You can glorify God in many stations in life. God may or may not have marriage promised for you, but it is still a worthy goal. It is a worthy thing to long for and to put some form in some healthy form of hope and work into, of course. But apparently that's just passe. That's just superficial. That's archaic. That's something that people cared about in 1937 but don't care about anymore. Look, it's a lie. Women still want to be protected. They still want to be pursued. They still want to be provided for. I don't care what kind of tough exterior a woman is portraying to the world. I promise you, she doesn't want a feminine, flimsy man who just does as he's told. She doesn't. Does she want a compassionate, kind, sensitive man who is willing to you know, support her as she supports him? Sure, in a lot of ways, yes. I, I think that that's absolutely true. Um, Does she want this guy who doesn't care about her feelings, who's just this macho guy who pretends, who patronizes her, belittles her, pretends like she's not capable of anything? No. But a woman wants a strong man. I promise you she does. Now, I think some women have deceived themselves into thinking they want a weak man, but they always end up being disappointed. And unfortunately, our society doesn't praise strength in men, doesn't praise masculinity, doesn't praise responsibility and provision and protection and all of these things that I think men can very uniquely provide. And so it's getting harder and harder for women to find those kind of men. But I promise you, deep down in our heart of hearts, women want strong men. We want masculine men. We want to be protected. We want to be provided for. We want to be pursued. Absolutely. And movies like this, that completely get wrong people's hearts, that pe- that completely get wrong human nature, they don't do well. This movie is not going to do well. Traditionally, Disney movies over the past couple years have not done well because people don't want a diversified, wokeified version of their favorite movies from the 80s and 90s or, you know, the mid-1900s. People don't want that. 
they would rather watch the 1937 version of Snow White than get this new and quote unquote improved version that just makes them feel bad and confused about the world. It's so stupid, but Disney doesn't care. Just like so many other companies, they don't care about making money. It's not about making money. If they cared about making money, then they would have kept Sound of Freedom. They dropped Sound of Freedom, which is still number three in the United States right now, which is pretty incredible. Still raking in tens of millions of dollars, despite all of the theater issues that are happening across the country to, I guess, try to inhibit people from being able to watch the movie. But they don't care about money. They care about an agenda. It goes back to a lot of what Justin and I were talking about last week. So make sure you go check out those episodes about why this radical and huge transformation of every sector of society is happening, what it is tied to. Yes, it's a spiritual war, but there's also a lot of other things behind it. All right, let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day, and that is Birch Gold. All right. We don't know what the future holds when it comes to the economy. You just want to make sure that your savings are protected as much as humanly possible. So you should diversify a portion of your savings into a hard asset, uh, hard asset, specifically gold. Diversify with gold from Birch Gold Group. Historically, gold has been a safe haven in times of high uncertainty, which is right now. You can get a free info kit on gold by texting Allie to 989-898 no obligation. You'll just get a free info kit. Text Ally to 989-898. Ally to 989-898. Okay, I was hoping to end in under an hour. Let me just do this real quick. I'm not going to be able to get into all of this stuff about the Florida slavery curriculum, Kamala Harris, and all of that. This could be a really long segment. Maybe we'll get more into it later this week. But Basically, what you're hearing is that Ron DeSantis and the state of Florida, because they're trying to change education from just being progressive indoctrination to being based on facts and encouraging critical thinking, that they are now introducing a pro-slavery curriculum. You're probably seeing people on your timeline say that Florida, the new curriculum, is uh, promoting the idea that slaver, that slaves actually benefited from slavery and so therefore slavery was nuanced or it was good and you had Kamala Harris the vice president of the United States going down to Florida last week and saying this here she was on July 20th giving a speech just yesterday in the state of Florida they decided middle school students will be taught that enslaved people benefited from slavery they insult us in an attempt to gaslight us, and we will not stand for it. Okay, so I thought she was in Florida. She wasn't in Florida, but she was giving that speech about the state of Florida. There are some other people who criticized um, who criticized him on this. Um, several people, several uh, headlines saying, New Florida standards teach students that some black people benefited from slavery because it taught useful skills. CBS, Florida schools to teach personal benefit of slavery under new black history curriculum. DeSantis, according to Washington Post, seeks to whitewash slavery in Florida curriculum. But if you actually read the 216 page document, which we will put in the description of this episode, you will see that that's not what's going on at all. Uh, the curriculum, like I said, is 216 pages. And so it's, um, it's very long. It might take you a long time to go through all of the bullet points, but it's very transparent about what it's going to be teaching. It's going to be teaching, uh, these students everything about slavery, how horrific it is, the methods used to, um, to buy these people from Africa, bring them over to the West, enslave them, what chattel slavery looked like, how harsh the conditions were. But they're also going to teach them about the different forms of forms of slavery that was happening, that were happening in the world. And by the way, teaching them that these Africans sold into slavery were sold by other Africans who were also enslaving them. That slavery, that chattel slavery is not unique to the United States. It's not unique to the West. It's certainly not unique to white people or any ethnicity. That unfortunately, this was a very tragic and absolutely disgusting practice that happened throughout the world, basically in every society that has ever existed and is still prevalent in parts of the world today. I don't know if they were going to teach that last part, the prevalence of slavery today, which people seem to be much uh, less incensed about, um, but they are going to teach the history of slavery and all the different aspects of it. 
one part of this slavery uh, curriculum is to say that some slaves, because of their own resilience, because of their own character, because of their own work ethic, were actually able to use some of the skills that they gained through the disgusting practice of chattel slavery to then later benefit themselves. Frederick Douglass is one such example. So you have people, I've even seen conservatives, They've try, they try so hard, some of those these conservatives, they try so hard to prove, oh, I'm moderate, I'm reasonable, I see some points at the left, I'm going to call out my side when I need to call out my side, and because they're so desperate to do that, they won't even look at the facts of a situation, they just want to put their commentary out there so they can like score some point from the other side or pretend like, you know... I don't know, like they're fair and impartial and all that, but they almost always get it wrong when they try to do that. And so I saw some people, some Fox News commentators, some people on the right, some conservatives saying, oh yeah, you know, I like DeSantis, but this is awful. I can't believe they're trying to whitewash slavery. This is not whitewashing slavery. There's nothing about this curriculum that we can see from the link that's provided from uh, for us uh, that justifies slavery in any way. Like understand how the propaganda machine works at this point. If anything sounds too good or too bad, as we have talked about before, uh, about the opposing side, then it's probably not completely true. There's probably something that you need to look into yourself, especially when it comes to Republicans and the right. Why do I say especially when it comes to Republicans and the right? Because the mainstream media, most of the institutions in this country are dominated by leftism. And so, of course, they're going to have a bias against the right. Of course, you're not going to be able to trust a headline from the Washington Post or a headline from CBS or NBC. They hate the right. They hate conservatives. They hate Republicans. Of course, they're going to lie. You really think that you can believe Vice President Kamala Harris when she says that Florida is promoting slavery? You really think that you can take her at her word? She can't even put a coherent sentence together. Her brain doesn't work that quickly. So you think that she is going to be able to uh, tell you the truth? You think she has that capacity? I'm not sure that she does. Most of what comes out of her mouth is just a completely incoherent, rambling mess of a mad woman, or it's a lie. Like, you should know that at this point, no matter what side of the aisle that you're on. So no, this curriculum doesn't promote the benefits of slavery. It doesn't whitewash slavery. Like, let's think a little bit, guys. Let's use our critical thinking skills or just use that thumb. Just use that thumb that you have to click a couple links and to read things yourself. Now, we've all made mistakes. We've all been hasty. We've all said things that we shouldn't have said. We've all commented on things too quickly. We've all believed what we want to believe because we have preconceived notions of what the other side is like. I've done that. I apologize for that. I see this way too much, though, when it comes to Christian women and race. Christian women and race, Christian conservative women. When it comes to these racial issues, they are so quick to jump on whatever narrative is being pushed out there that black people are being marginalized by curriculum or laws or whatever it is because they want to be seen as, at least in this area, progressive or an ally or whatever, and they end up perpetuating a lie. And that really bothers me. It's bothered me so much since 2020 because I see this gullibility and this naivete and maybe this like purposeful ignorance because you want to be accepted by this group of people. You want to be seen as moderate. You want to be seen as nuanced. And so you don't do the work to actually look into a headline like this because saying that, oh, Ron DeSantis promotes racism and white supremacy through Florida curriculum will score you some points with the racial reconciliation crowd. It's sad. Don't lie. Don't be gullible. I mean, those aren't Christian virtues. Let's be thoughtful. Let's be critical thinkers. Let's look past these stupid headlines. This is a great curriculum as far as I can see. I don't know. I can't vouch for it. I haven't seen every single page of the curriculum. This is just a summary. This 2000, or uh, uh, 216 page document. But from what I've seen, it's good. Like we should be teaching kids about Booker T. Washington and uh, Frederick Douglass and all and Thomas Sowell, like that should all be a part of Black history. What they really want is uh, the People's History of the United States, which was a propaganda book that pushed the narrative that America is exclusively a vessel of oppression and white supremacy. That's what they want. They really want these kids to be lied to. 
They want black kids to hate their skin. They want white kids to hate their skin. They want to cause this kind of division. They say they want reconciliation. Really, they want history to propagate the lie that white people have always been oppressors of black and brown people and that we still are not out from under those effects today because this allows the government, specifically progressives in power, to have more power. That's what the play is here. And I, Florida is saying we're not going to be a part of that. We're going to teach facts. It is what it is. The question should always be, is it true? Not do I like this or does it sound good, but is it true? Is it true that some slaves, because of their own resilience, benefited from some of the skills that they gained while they were under the tyranny, the oppression of slavery? Yes, that is true. Done. Done. Ugh. My goodness. Okay. I know this is a long episode, but I've been out of town and I had a lot of things to say. Let me tell you about our last sponsor for the day and then we'll be out of this. Okay. Uh, the last sponsor for the day is called, I dropped my script. One second. A crazy little thing called marriage. And it is a podcast uh, from Focus on the Family. And it is with Dr. Greg and Aaron Smalley. They're the hosts. It drops every Monday. They're going through every marriage issue that you can think of. They want to make sure that your marriage not just is surviving, but it's really thriving. So from a christ Center perspective, they want to help you and your spouse be the best that you can be. Have uh, the healthiest marriage that you can possibly have for each other and also for your children. So check it out. It's called Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage. Doctors, a doctor and uh, Greg and Aaron Smalley have a ton of experience talking about this. They know they they know this subject in and out. So check it out. Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage. Wherever you get your podcast drops every Monday. So there's a new episode today. Crazy Little Thing Called Marriage. <music> Okay, I didn't know that we would be spending that much time on Jason Aldean and on Barbie, but I had a lot to say about these things. Hope you enjoyed it. It's a longer episode, but a little bit more of a lighthearted episode, hopefully infusing some sanity back into your day. Um, Thank you guys so much for listening. Please leave a five-star review if you love this podcast. Please share this podcast if with your friends if you love it as well. Um, and we will be back here tomorrow.